okay uh, good afternoon people so uh, so far in the last class what we had looked at was the process of translation that is protein synthesis and we had looked at the activation of amino acid in terms of uh, the amino acid transferase action the attachment of the activated amino acid with trna so that pre initiation complex and then binding of that pre initiation complex for the formation of polypeptide chain in initiation elongation and termination process and then at the end we are yet to look at that is the modification of release polypeptide chain so let's go over quickly over one by one these steps and then we will start the new topic so activation if you remember this reaction where the amino acid uh, was getting transferred to the trna and in this whole reaction this amino acid trna synthetase that was used along with the atp and then what you get is the activated amino acid and these are the reactions for that then something called as initiation factors let me go to the diagram it's easy up here something called as initiation factors along with the gtp they will bind to the 30s subunit uh, of the ribosomal uh, structure and trna also comes and binds to it so that uh, it will form a pre initiation complex and due to the uh, like you by usage of energy this initiation factors and the gtp is broken down or hydrolyzed so that the 50s subunit can bind and it will form the complete 70s initiation complex so that was the uh, starting phase before the uh, elongation starts happening of the uh, polypeptide or of the uh, protein molecule so uh, where is this yeah so that was the uh, like addition of the uh, like first amino acid based on the uh, this n formyl methionine uh, amino acid with the trna so that was the 70s complex now as and when the whole of this translational assembly keeps moving along that will need the help of translocase which shifts the whole of the mrna molecule by a codon so that uh, like uh, this translation assembly will keep on moving to the five uh, three prime end of the mrna and uh, one thing that i missed to mention is the peptidyl synthetase which joins the neighboring amino acid with the peptide bond or it's also called as peptidyl transferase so that way it will keep connecting the new Uh, amino acid molecule and the translocase will keep shifting the mrn so that way the elongation happens with the help of various elongation factors which are different in prokaryote and eukaryote uh and the last stage was the termination uh, of this polypeptide chain synthesis because of this releasing factor coming into picture and the uh, last stop codon which does not code for trna molecule so there is no trna molecule to recognize the termination codon so it ultimately releases this releasing factor which comes and bind and dissociate whole of the uh, assembly so that was the whole mechanism so far we had looked at uh, in terms of uh, what we call as the translation mechanism uh now so from this will be the new that we have not covered so far now the last stage in the mechanism of translation is the modification now we all know whatever protein that uh, has been synthesized is not going to be functional at all right because it just uh, like amino acids added one after another though they will be right in sequence and everything will be true in terms of sequence but it will not be functional because it needs certain modification so the formyl group of the first amino acid that is formulated methionine is removed by the enzyme deformylase now if you remember the first step that was the addition of n formyl methionine to the trna molecule that n formyl group has to be removed from the methionine amino acid and it has to be only methionine so that action is catalyzed by n deformylase so it will just remove the formyl group 
from the methionine amino acid. Also, yes. Or like in the last class, did we do termination? Yes, we did termination as well. I remember talking about. Uh, let me go back. I I remember talking of these dissociation factors and releasing factors. So before this is so before this is elongation, right? Yeah, elongation and this translocation and stuff. I I I remember because we discussed this part that no tRNA will re, uh, will be there, and also these ones specifically, they have uh, specific uh, signals. You think we haven't done this? So like uh, till the end of my notes, I have. Or uh, completed the elongation part, but I haven't like like uh, I don't remember this. Okay, so then let's go over it. I I might be mistaken because we keep on going back and forth at times. So let's go back a little bit then. So elongation, I assume that part is clear. So after elongation, that is the termination phase. That's where the stop codon comes into picture. So elongation is terminated when the amino acid site. Reaches the termination codon, and that's uh, these codons. We know now these are the three one UAA, UGA, UAG, right? And they had certain names also which we had mentioned earlier. So, but there is no tRNA molecule to recognize the termination codon. So, the like that A site will remain empty. Now, because that site remaining empty, there will be certain modification in the ribosomal structures which will secrete the releasing factors and this releasing factor is required for the separation of the polypeptide chain from the terminal tRNA terminal tRNA as in the second last one right because uh, there will be no tRNA for the last stop codon so this releasing factor will be required for releasing or separation of the polypeptide chain from the terminal tRNA that is the second last Uh, tRNA molecule, and these releasing factors in prokaryote they are very specific. So if it is UAG or UAA codon, it will secrete RF1 uh, because again they will be recognized by the uh, amino acid site of the ribosome. So respective releasing factors can be released, and this is again a chain of uh, metabolic, not metabolic, chain of uh, pathway uh, within the cell. Which leads to secretion of this uh, respective releasing factors. If it is UGA stop codon, then it will be specific to RF2, and RF3 is required for stimulation of RF1 and RF2. So in general, it will be first RF3, which will come into picture along with the ribosome molecule. It will bind to the ribosome. It will check which of the stop codon is present. And it will stimulate either RF1 or RF2 based on uh, whichever stop codon it is, and then it will release that polypeptide uh, from the tRNA molecule. So then, whatever remains is the free ribosome. Polypeptide has gone. Whatever was synthesized, the ribosome, the free ribosome, will dissociate into two subunits back to its like uh, 30s and 50s subunits. With the help of dissociation factor, so once RF3 has recruited RF1 or RF2, it will release the polypeptide. It will bring in to picture the dissociation factor, or what is also called as RF3, and that will release the two subunits as well. First thing it does is recruit RF1 or RF2, and second thing it does is dissociation of the uh, two subunits. of the ribosome and same mrna can be used repeatedly for the synthesis of multiple copies of the polypeptide and again this whole process can restart if there are more number of uh, protein molecules which are required of the same protein so so same mrna copy can be used and until and unless this mrna is intact with the ribosome or it is in close vicinity to the ribosome it does not get degraded once it is devoid of any ribosomal factors or any of those pre initiation complex factors it will uh, surely going to go for degradation so that is the termination uh, or release of the polypeptide chain 
Now, any question? Uh, but uh, earlier in uh, uh, mRNA, didn't we say that uh, only one RNA, one mRNA makes one polypeptide chain? Ha, one ribosomal assembly at a time can only synthesize one mRNA. No, no, no. One mRNA like makes one polypeptide chain. Like, didn't we say that? So that means it will code for that polypeptide only. That is what it means by one mRNA codes for one protein or one polypeptide. It means like if the sequence is specific, mRNA and polypeptide, they are sequence specific. One mRNA cannot code for two different uh, sequences of the protein. That is what it means. So, but uh, doesn't it like degenerate as soon as it's done coding for no not really it it depends on the signal see uh, if you remember again mrna is made stable with different factors based on the structure of uh, mrna molecule that g capping uh, poly a tail and so on right so if these uh, parts of mrna they are intact then that mrna is relatively stable the moment this dissociation factor has dissociated the ribosome and the next ribosomal assembly starts forming, then that mRNA cannot be degraded. But once this whole of the assembly is kind of separate and that poly A tail is removed, that G capping from mRNA is removed, then that mRNA will go for degradation process. Otherwise not. So uh, after the uh, assembly is removed, the mRNA might or might not undergo rapid dissociation. Yeah, depends on what are the signaling mechanisms and depends on the requirement of the protein or polypeptide that is required. So, it, my uh, mRNA doesn't have to have a short life. It can have a longer life depending. No, no, no. It cannot go on for longer. It, it will have relatively shorter life compared to other uh, types of RNA. But uh, in that sense, like, see, like we had said, uh, seen that part, uh, uh, the speed of or the rate at which the amino acids are being added, that's relatively very, like, short fraction of seconds, right? I guess it was one amino acid per uh, second in eukaryotes. So if you just think of eukaryotes, that's like good enough if you have 100 or even 200 uh, protein molecules, or oh, sorry, uh, amino acid molecule within a protein, that will be done within four or five minutes, approximately again, right? And the elongation, uh, sorry, uh, the degradation time for mRNA is usually two to four hours, right? So within that much of uh, time, if at all multiple copies of the proteins are required, that can happen as well. Okay, I hope this part is clear. Uh, sir, uh -huh. uh, a protein, won't it have something like 10,000 amino acids? Uh, rarely, there are very few proteins which are this long. I thought like that was the average. No, average I guess should be somewhere around 1,000 to 2,000 amino acids or, so, or maybe less for sure, around 1,000. Uh, so, like uh, these releasing factors, they mentioned prokaryotes. So, are they the same in eukaryotes? Uh, we will talk of that uh, in next slide. There are just subtle changes. Okay. Uh, protein uh, sequence. Uh, yeah. See, the current estimate for average protein length is around 300. If we believe the source, 300. I'm still talking of a little higher. So yeah. So one, one residue is one amino acid. Yeah, one residue is one amino acid. But it like it's like rarely you will have proteins which are really really long. So that is what is the process of evolution also. Uh, maybe earlier uh, cases. Uh, when the organisms, they were huge, like for example, dinosaurs, they might have had different set of proteins. Uh, but over the time, the proteins they have been becoming smaller and smaller. Uh, that's what has been known as well. And they have become more uh, 
uh, what we say effective or efficient okay uh, so that's the termination now we can go to the modification part which we had started okay so uh, the first so, thing, uh, one more thing so the dissociation factor they also called it rfd yes and there was a releasing factor was also rfd like there was one releasing factor uh, so uh, technically these are two different factors but in your textbook they have mentioned as one it's complex okay so there's a complex of releasing and dissociation factors in one group okay correct so usually like at the school level uh, these textbooks or even reference book they don't mention of the whole of the mechanism there are like what we have known is already uh, almost 10 or 15 proteins that we have seen but there are almost 70 80 more that we haven't looked at so this is like a very simplistic mechanism that we look at and then there are like one recruit another another recruit third one and then they form a complex and that will cause certain effect which will again recruit further proteins so it is like a chain of events okay so uh, in the modification so the first step as soon as that polypeptide has been separated from the ribosomal assembly or the translational assembly is the deformulation process that is removal of the formyl group from the methionine which was the first amino acid added into the uh, polypeptide chain and in some of the cases where uh, it is like especially again in case of prokaryote there are uh, enzymes called as exopeptidase which will remove some amino acid either from N terminal or from C terminal or both. But this is like conditional. If at all it is required, then only this exopeptidase will uh, be functional. Otherwise, if it is starting from ATG and if it is chopping off uh, the amino acids from N terminal, that protein will be dysfunctional. It may not be useful at all. So this action of exopeptidase is uh, conditional. So as and when it is required, the exopeptidase comes into picture and it will remove those respective amino acids if at all uh, it is not required in some cases uh, the first uh, portion of the uh, peptide uh, can have a different form altogether and then the action of exopeptidase is required in some cases but again uh, that's like totally a different topic here the unfolded primary structure now what like i said is only the simpler uh, amino acid sequence in a polypeptide chain so that is what is unfolded primary structure of the polypeptide will change into secondary or tertiary structure by folding uh, now if you remember uh, the protein structure there was primary secondary tertiary and quaternary so these were different types of structure primary was just simpler chain of amino acids, secondary was that beta pleated sheets and so on and tertiary was uh, furthermore folding uh, of the protein into three dimensional structure and the uh, uh, quaternary structure was if at all it has to become a dimer, tetramer or whatsoever that was the different types of protein structure. So these protein structure uh, like they are becoming the functional one after folding so that it assumes the three dimensional structure and these actions though so the special proteins that is called as molecular chaperons they control the protein folding which are again these chaperons these are another proteins right they will control the folding of the newly synthesized polypeptide or newly synthesized protein molecule that action is controlled by molecular chaperons uh the physiological activity of some proteins that acts as enzymes they are altered by phosphorylation or hydroxylation of some amino acid right again that is one type of modification that happens in the proteins like some specific activities of the enzyme uh, or, or that protein or polypeptide which is synthesized by the process of translation might need a, a little modification into 
uh, the amino acid sequences again not all maybe very specific amino acid let's say within 500 amino acid it needs uh, 253rd amino acid to be hydroxylated again this depends on uh, how that protein is interacting or how that enzyme is interacting while it is causing the reaction so that physiological activity of some protein is dependent uh, on this phosphorylation or hydroxylation of specific amino acids similarly what we know of glycoproteins when these proteins they are associated with uh, carbohydrate to form a certain structure that is uh, also one type of modification that happens uh, in the release polypeptide chain so uh, i guess that's it uh, yeah uh, that's it uh, with respect to the modification there are quite a few more modification but again it's like beyond the scope of uh, the syllabus so we will stick to only these as of now first is deformulation uh, that is almost common for every prokaryotic protein in the second case the folding uh, that is gaining that uh, three dimensional structure and if at all specific phosphorylation or hydroxylation or any modification required that can happen as well so these are the uh, different modification in the protein after translation uh, any question here okay so then this is uh, to answer your question pratham uh, translation in eukaryotes so what happens in prokaryotes is what we have seen and again most of the process remains same except there are little changes so for example the initiation of polypeptide synthesis is brought about by non formulated methionine in the first case prokaryotes we had seen that was uh, nf met that formulated methionine was required to initiate whole of that translation process in this case it happens without any formal group because obviously the initiation factors they are different in these cases right so that way they may not need that formulated group or formulated methionine to initiate the process of translation initiation factors again these are just different uh, li name uh, specifically putting the e prefix uh, to the initiation factor 1 2 3 so there are i guess five or six total initiation factor or maybe 10 i don't know exactly but there are quite a few initiation factor and they are recruited based on whatever is the specific uh, action usually whenever there are more than one uh, protein like this like we are seeing here in case of initiation factors these are usually forming complexes which it with each other like we had seen that releasing factor 3 will recruit releasing factor 1 or 2 right so that way these molecules they function all together and that's why there will be uh, so many different forms so that is another difference uh, in terms of prokaryote to eukaryote translation the eukaryotic mrna is monocystronic while that in uh, prokaryote was polycystronic that means genes they were all in one sequence while in case of eukaryote this is usually a single gene and then some non coding sequence then again another single gene so mrna is also monocystronic in eukaryote so that is one difference between prokaryote to eukaryote and only one releasing factor that is erf1 is present to identify the termination codon in eukaryote rest whole of the process translocation elongation all of that remains same uh any question in this translation in eukaryote okay so then translocation of the protein so the release proteins they are employed in the synthesis of new uh, translocation of the protein this is not meaning the translocation that we had seen earlier now the protein has completely formed where does that protein go to that is what is translocation okay please do not get confused with this translocation and the translocation step that we had seen in terms of mrna movement by the enzyme translocates that is totally different process altogether so the release protein that is uh, formed and modified they are employed in the synthesis of new cytoplasm so whenever the uh, uh, cells are dividing 
they form new cytoplasm they duplicate materials proteins and organelles and that is when the new cytoplasm is formed so these release proteins they are employed there or as a component of different cell organelles or they can also be used as enzymes depending on whatever that protein is so they can be uh, translocated to the respective spaces glycosylation among uh, sorry forming the glycoprotein in golgi body so in golgi bodies whatever proteins are present they are glycosylated that means addition of that glycosyl group uh, to form the glycoprotein that is the combination of the carbohydrate uh, or saccharides uh, with the uh, protein molecule and some become integral part of the endoplasmic reticulum membrane as ribosomes are attached to the er the what you know of rough endoplasmic reticulum so these proteins they become integral part of the endoplasmic reticulum membrane and uh, that is what form the uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum and in the uh, lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum that is within the membranes they reach golgi apparatus and they form hydrolytic enzyme for example uh, in lysosomes right some of the proteins so depending on whatever that protein is either they can become a part of the membrane they can become a part of enzyme they can become a part of structural uh, complex of the organelle so that will vary uh, from protein to protein but that's where the protein go at the end after they are been completely synthesized so that's the translocation part now so this with this we are actually done with whole of the process of dna replication then transcription and the translation so that whole central dogma of the cell is completed here now this is kind of additional information so there are various antibiotics that we know of which are commonly used for treatment of various bacterial or viral infection and these are the uh, antibiotics which are uh, like kind of color coded and their specific action is being written so with in relation to the uh, protein synthesis so for example tetracycline again uh, something like doxycycline or amoxy uh, no what is that tetracycline doxycycline only that i remember of uh, that molecule which is commonly used for uh, infection whether it's a stomach infection or throat infection doctor prescribe them Uh, so that molecule which is the derivative of tetracycline will inhibit the amino acid trna to ribosome so the binding is inhibited because of its structural presence it will go and bind to the ribosome molecule so will not allow the amino acid trna to bind to the ribosome so that the proteins are not synthesized if the proteins are not synthesized the bacteria uh, will not be able to divide and grow so that is the mechanism by which tetracycline works so yes it can also affect human it can also affect human because uh, no. so these are specific to prokaryotes so but uh, like most of the process is the same and even uh, eukaryotes need the uh, uh, activated trna to attach to the ribosome Hmm. also need amino acids right right but in case the ribosomal structure is different in prokaryote and eukaryote right so uh, yes ha huh. so that's when this molecules uh, will not function in eukaryotic cell it can go and uh, like uh, you know uh, may enter into the eukaryotic cell but it will not be able to inhibit because it does not have specific binding site so all these antibiotics that we are talking of they have very few side effects means in general compared to uh, like how cancerous drugs they are uh, not able to differentiate between uh, normal cell and cancerous cell but these ones these are drastically two different systems one is prokaryote other one is eukaryote so there there is quite a lot of scope to design those specific drugs and that's why for all these drug that holds to uh, that they are not so uh, uh, like active in the eukaryotic stages so the second one is streptomycin 
uh, which inhibits the initiation of translation. Uh, like again, I am assuming streptomycin is a huge molecule and that will interfere with the initiation process because they have highly reactive group. It will go and bind to those respective uh, sites on the ribosome or on the different uh, molecules uh, which initiate the translation process and then thereby they will block the protein synthesis. Neomycin will inhibit the interaction between tRNA and mRNA that is the uh, anti-codon to codon interaction. Uh, neomycin is again used in some kind of infection uh, 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 that is like uh, usually the stomach infection or flu kind of uh, infection. Chloramphenicol. Uh, chloramphenicol is very commonly used in your eye drops. So whenever you have that conjunctivitis, chloramphenicol is uh, quite frequently used. So there are these very tiny uh, single time use drops that you get in a medical shop. Uh, that contains chloramphenicol. Uh, so, this chloramphenicol inhibits the action of enzyme peptidyl transferase and that's why it will block the formation of the peptide bond. Again, the peptidyl transferase in human and in prokaryote is different. Uh, means structurally they are different. So, obviously the binding of chloramphenicol will also be different. Erythromycin, very commonly used roxid uh, drug. Uh, roxithromycin, it is a derivative of erythromycin that you use it for the cuff, uh, is one of the molecule which inhibits the translocation of the ribosome along with the uh, mRNA. So most likely I assume it will be the translocase enzyme which will be uh, inhibited in this case. Puromycin, uh, this is one of the, uh, uh, I guess this drug is used in cancer also to the best that I remember. Uh, so it binds to the C terminus of the growing polypeptide causing the premature termination. So whenever this molecule uh, will be available within the prokaryotic cell, uh, it will go and, and I, I assume this also functions, some derivative also functions in the eukaryotic cell as well because um, that's what I remember, but I can be wrong at times. So this binds to the C terminus. So uh, as and when the polypeptide chain is, let's say, uh, grown into uh, up to the half of its length, puromycin can go and bind and that will cause the premature termination because again, it's a uh, steric hindrance, uh, which is like a huge molecule, which will not allow the other DNA molecule to come and bind and continue the elongation process. So, uh, yeah, it is mentioned here, ribosome in both eukaryote and prokaryotes as well. So, that is the uh, puromycin. Actinomycin inhibits the action of RNA polymerase uh, and the synthesis of RNA, uh, RNA. So, these kind of drugs, they can also be used in case of viruses because that's where the RNA polymerase uh, comes into picture as well. So, these are the different molecules which inhibit protein synthesis. Uh, in general. Most of these molecules, they are also used uh, in the regular uh, protein uh, research work because they have specific action. So let's say you want to block some uh, action and check what are the effects on that particular cell. Uh, one can use these particular uh, drugs or medicines. Okay, so the next part uh, uh, I hope you have no questions. If at all you have, you can ask. Uh, but otherwise, I'll move on. Okay. So, then the next topic after translation is regulation of gene expression. Now, we while we are looking at the replication or even the structural arrangement and so on, we had looked at there are genes, there are non-coding sequences. Again, there are genes and non-coding sequences. So this can go on uh, in the chromatin file. Now, how does a cell know that this is a particular gene that it needs to express or and the second one need not be expressed, right? So that is what is called as switching on and off of the genes. So they are uh, switched on and off as per the requirement as they may be required at different times during the cell cycle, different times, different spaces within the cell. So all of these conditions 
that needs a particular gene either to be switched on or switched off for a particular uh, time frame so in all of these cell types some genes they synthesize enzymes all the time and these type of genes they are called as constitutive genes so for example uh, glycolytic enzymes right because glucose is required every now and then so that glycolysis cycle has to be on every now and then and the energy has to be generated every time so those kind of genes or those kind of enzymes will be related to those genes specifically and these genes are called as constitutive genes because they are always on right so for other genes transcription of mrna is initiated only on demand and they are switched off when it is uh, when the need is fulfilled that is conditional type of uh, transcription and this is called as regulation of the gene action or expression or it is also called as genetic control of the protein synthesis process so that is what we are going to look at in brief again not in detail so for example in e coli bacteria there is an enzyme which is called as beta galactosidase which is needed to catalyze the hydrolysis of lactose into glucose and galactose that is from disaccharide to monosaccharide and this enzyme is synthesized only when lactose is present in the medium so uh, simplest thing like you take e coli bacteria which has uh, galactosidase and you add glucose uh, miss galactosidase is present in the gene of the e coli so if you add glucose to the medium in which e coli is growing then only galactosidase will be synthesized and if you put e coli in lactose minus uh, culture medium then beta galactosidase will not be synthesized so that is like switching on and off of a particular gene based on the requirement or based on the condition so that is one example of this regulation of the gene action and these uh, conditions they can be either metabolic that means they have certain metabolic processes associated with that gene or physiological that means certain action has to be evoked for example let's say uh, muscle pull or uh, muscle has to do certain action or contraction and relaxation then those type of actions they are physiological or hormonal secretion or insulin secretion any of those or environmental condition right during the developmental phase uh, depending on the polarity of the cells the gene expression they are altered and that is when the cell they attain different uh, differentiation all right they be, they go on becoming different types of cell so that is like environmental condition based on the surrounding uh, situation the cells change their orientation and in all of these condition uh, the gene expression is regulated it's not constitutive at all it is highly regulated so uh, now the regulation of gene expression can be of two types either it is quantitative that is different in a difference in amounts of proteins of different genes or it can be the amount of protein produced by a gene at different times or different tissue uh, i hope you got the difference between these two that means one protein can be uh, uh, synthesized to different amount uh, and it can be of different genes right for example we had seen that in case of skin pigment there were various genes and all of those genes they are expressed and depending on which genes are expressed uh, the color of the skin was decided so that is like quantitative and the second regulation of the uh, gene expression it also involves the amount of protein produced by one particular gene but at different times and different tissues right uh, again for example p53 which is one of the protein if it is present in a cell it is a tumor suppressor protein so if it is present in the cell tumor may not be generated but if it is absent in cell it will be uh, means it can lead to the tumor uh, genesis of that cell right so that is another example of how much of one particular protein can uh, be expressed because of one particular gene uh, into different uh, at different times or in different tissues so that is just uh, two types in which regulation of gene expression can happen now at what levels does the gene regulation happen 
this is all we have seen already it can happen at transcriptional level that means uh, during the primary mrna transcript formation it can be controlled so the rna transcript itself can be blocked to a certain extent so that the protein translation does not happen right let's say one round of the protein translation has happened and that much of protein is sufficient so the for next stage it can block at the transcriptional level itself or if it is required in more it can let go of that uh, transcriptional process so that more and more protein can be synthesized so these are the levels that we are talking about then second one can be post transcriptional that is after the uh, mrna is synthesized the functional mrna has to be formed that is that addition of g capping or poly a t that functional mrna can be controlled at uh, that is one another level of uh, gene regulation then transport of mrna from nucleus to cytoplasm if the uh, mrna does not get transported from nucleus to cytoplasm that will ultimately does not uh, will not lead to the protein synthesis so that can act as one more mechanism or more and more mrna can be transported outside the nucleus to the cytoplasm so more and more protein can be synthesis both ways it is possible but that is still uh, regulated or controlled gene expression translation during polypeptide synthesis how many mrna molecules or one mrna molecule undergoes how many types of translation process that is another level of gene regulation or pro post translation that is after the modification uh, after the uh, polypeptide synthesis whatever modification is required that can also uh, act as one another level of gene regulation so these are the different levels of gene regulation in general any question anyone so far in this slide specifically i hope uh, these parts are clear now we had hardly left with very small topics uh, and that we will see one by one but i guess we will be we should be done by tomorrow or day after max with this whole chapter okay so now what are those mechanism that work for gene regulation in prokaryotes specifically so the rate of transcription in prokaryote is controlled by the initiation of the transcription itself uh, itself and this is done by using on and off mechanism now what is this on and off mechanism that's what will be explained here so the transcription of mrna will start when the rna polymerase recognizes the initiation site at a given promoter this we had already seen and this is regulated by the regulatory protein which can act both ways either by positive regulation which is called as activator or inducer or uh, and is the process is called as induction or it can also act by negative re regulation and the process is called as repression and these molecules which will uh, suppress uh, the gene uh, transcription that will be called as gene repressors so there can be gene inducers or activators or there can be gene repressors based on whether they promote the transcription process or they block the transcription process so the first example of gene regulation by induction that is positive regulation or it is also called as inducible system so genes are switched on or induced to produce more and more mrna by a substance called as inducer or activator this can be simpler chemical molecules this can be protein molecule this can be any other type of molecule there can be artificial or natural but these molecules if they are inducing a particular gene to synthesize mrna they will be called as inducers or activators example lactose acts as an inducer for beta galactosidase that is what we had seen in the earlier cases uh, the example that i had given you so when there were whenever there is lactose present in the culture medium of the e coli beta galactosidase will be synthesized so that lactose is acting as a positive regulator or inducer for the uh, g beta galactosidase and if it is absent 
then it will not allow the uh, beta galaxies to function or uh, to uh, synthesize the mrna transcript at all so that is positive regulation or induction uh, regulation then the second one that is the negative regulation that is the gene regulation by repression or it is also called as repressible system like earlier one was called as inducible system now in this case tryptophan operon in e coli operon is actually a uh, what we call as uh, combination of the genes so that is what is present in most of the prokaryotic what we commonly call as polycystronic right but it may not be always poly it can be two or three together that we call as operon so the presence of certain substances or the end product may suppress the activity of certain gene uh, to synthesize a specific protein so let's say for example uh, in simplest uh, example that is given here is synthesis of amino acid tryptophan in e coli is controlled by five enzymes in succession produced by the gene that is tryptophan e trypto d c b and a these are the five genes now the moment there is enough of the tryptophan synthesized in the particular system or particular culture then these genes will be activated and which will cause uh, which will block the synthesis of the amino acid tryptophan it's kind of negative regulation so the end product itself that is the tryptophan it is blocking uh, the certain gene uh, i mean the gene which is coding for the tryptophan synthesis and it will cause a reduction in that uh, tryptophan level or rather the further tryptophan will not be synthesized at all so that is like one example uh, of the tryptophan operon in e coli Uh, as an example of repressible system the second example of the gene regulation by repression is the lac operon system uh, so lac operon it is called as uh, uh, like again the operon uh, we know it is a combination of the two or three genes and lac stands for lactose so there were these two guys jacob and mono Uh, while studying the catabolism that is breakdown of lactose in e coli they explain that there are three enzymes called beta galactosidase lactose permease or lac permease and trans acetylase which are needed for the lactose catabolism process right and the dna segment for these particular genes they are uh, represented by lac z lac y and lac a and these are structural genes that means they are present uh, in a particular structural frame of the uh, kind of cystronic arrangement one after another so these three genes so these are these structural genes they are located in a linear sequence what we called as operon that is the linear sequence in the bacterial chromosome so the action of these genes is controlled by the coordinated manner by regulatory genes and which along with the structural gene they form an operon regulatory gene will be your actual lactose uh, metabolism or uh, other genes which are involved in lactose metabolism these along with these three genes so all the other regulatory genes along with the structural genes they are forming an operon and this operon model for lactose catabolism is called as lac operon which functions by repressible mechanism so more and more lactose is catabolized they will block uh, the further expression of this lac uh, operon genes so that is the lac operon system which is another example of repressible system uh, any question here okay uh, we will stop here for today tomorrow we will start with the gene regulation in eukaryotes and then there are very small small topics and the last one uh, is the human genome project and i guess uh, we will be done with it uh, hopefully by tomorrow if not we will spill it over for one more day uh, but we will finish the chapter for sure by then and this is the last topic of this whole chapter that is human genome project